Hello all, welcome to uh, the first lecture that I'm posting. This is the first video lecture of the semester. Uh, this is just a quick lecture. I'm going to go through some basic ideas and terminology that we use when we're discussing uh, plot in narrative, especially with short stories, but uh, we can use this these terms, this schemata to talk about any narrative. You've probably heard some of these terms before. You might be familiar with this under a different name. I'm going to introduce this uh, as, as something called Freytag's Pyramid. You might have also heard it called a story arc, something like that, narrative arc. Uh, it's uh, become, most of the terms are, are pretty embedded in our culture. So I'm just going to talk through this. It's some, some pretty basic terminology we use when we're discussing narrative. Uh, okay, so uh, let me just uh, get my slideshow to work. Here we go. So Freytag's Pyramid, right, shaped like a pyramid, as you can see here like a cone. I'll uh, come back to this shape at the end because it's a little misleading, but this is a basic, um, you know, visual uh, visual representation of Freytag's pyramid. So Freytag, he was a, a German um, critic of mostly plays, and he came up with this uh, this scheme, this, this 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 visual guide, and some of these terms. He, he he coined some of these terms, or at least used them in the way that they're used. None of these are like new words or new ideas, but he put this all together in the way uh, that I'm going to talk about. He was, um, again, a critic, a novelist, a playwright. He came up with this pyramid to talk about the structure of classical plays. That's what he was interested in using this to um, discuss. So, you know, Shakespearean and uh, classic Athenian plays mostly. Um, but, you know, it's become um, wider used than that, more widely used. We can use this to discuss all kinds of narrative. It's especially useful when we're talking about short stories, because a short story is a condensed narrative, right? Everything has to happen very quickly. Uh, you know, there has to be, there doesn't have to be, but there generally is this this kind of scheme, right? A very uh, uh, recognizable climax, because, you know, a, a short story, most short stories have a real punch to them, right? There's kind of some kind of twist or some kind of like revelation that anchors the short story and gives it its like thematic um, power, right? When you're when you're writing like a novel, if you have like 300, 400 pages to play around with characters and ideas, you can do this in a much different way. You can have like, um, if you're familiar with the work of Dickens, you know Dickens would have basically like an action beat every two chapters. He was writing for newspapers, so he would, it was like a little mini climax, like every two chapters, and it would lead up to the big climax. So a very different kind of structure you can you can use in something like a novel or a play or something, whereas a short story is, you know, generally a narrative you can sit down and read in, in one sitting quickly, you know, half an hour or whatever. So it's got to, you know, introduce characters quickly, introduce conflict quickly, and get to that climax in a satisfying, quick way. So that's why it's this, this scheme of Freytag's pyramid or narrative arc is very useful for us when we're talking about uh, short stories. So let's get into it. Uh, the first stage, um, and that would be, see, this is the first stage down here, this flat part. Second stage is this uh, ascending uh, line, and then the top part is here. Third part, fourth part is coming down the other side, and then the fifth part is this second plateau, okay? So the first part is what we call exposition, or introduction, if you prefer. This is the initial part of the story and establishes the, the context for the rest of the story. It sets up uh, setting, characters, uh, conflict, usually, right? Um, if there's an antagonist and a protagonist, that kind of stuff is set up in the beginning, uh, you know, what this story is about. And again, you know, a short story is a condensed kind of narrative, so this has to be set up very quickly in a general way, uh, generally. Um, and, you know, that can be introduced in a variety of different ways. Right? Not every short story follows a formula. Um, sometimes, as we're going to see later, there's, a, there's stories like Blood Child, I'm jumping way ahead, uh, where Octavia Butler just throws us into the action with very little exposition. And, you know, she's doing this deliberately to disorient, disorient us, right? Whereas the first story we're going to look at, the story of an hour, uh, there's a very clear setup of characters and ideas and relationships that are then kind of twisted later on in very interesting ways. So there's the exposition, setting up, introducing, setting up the setting, conflict characters. The second stage, so we're going up the pyramid. This is what's called the rising action, right? So this is this is kind of the bulk of the story for the most part. This is where we get a series of plotted events um, that develop the conflict and the central characters through these events. And remember, you know, a, a short story or any kind of narrative is a, 
is a kind of selection of moments, if you will, right? You know, um, we don't, if we're reading, uh, go back to the story of an hour, which we're going to be looking at in week one, um, you know, uh, you know, we don't get every second of the narrative, right? We don't get her breathing going up the stairs, right? We get a selection of events that are important for the narrative. And that's what happens in the rising action. We get these series of moments that are important to developing character uh, and conflict and such. There's also usually what's called the inciting incident. So, you know, usually we have characters living in a world, something happens that leads to a series of events that gets to the climax, right? So the event or motivation that ties the protagonist into the action of the story. Otherwise, they just go about their lives, right? Uh, again, the story of an hour, which we're going to be reading. If um, you know, if if something didn't happen, then our protagonist would probably just be having tea that morning, and there would be no story to tell. So there's some kind of inciting incident that gets us to that climax, okay? Which takes us to stage three, the climax of the story, right? And this is the moment of highest drama or tension. And it marks a turning point, a kind of testing of our protagonist, right? And that doesn't mean necessarily exterior. It can be an interior one, as we're going to see. I keep going back to the story of an hour, but why not? We're doing that this week. You know, our protagonist faces an interior struggle. She has this, uh, this con the conflict is interior, her coming to terms with a big change in her life and what she thinks about that. Um, so the, the, the climax for her is interior, not exterior. Right, exterior. I note here, a uh, superhero film uh, generally has an exterior kind of climax. Right, if you watch, um, you know, one of the Avenger films, and I haven't seen any of them, so I'm going on faith here. But or say Batman, one of the uh, the Christopher Nolan Batman movies. You know, there's a struggle throughout the movie, then it comes, you know, it comes together when Batman fights the Joker at the end. Right, and that's the climax of the movie. Um, and, you know, the force of good, the forces of good as embodied by a superhero like Batman or the Avengers or whatever, they're fighting Thanos or Joker or um, they embody like uh, chaos or evil or whatever, right? Uh, and they come together in this climax at the end of the film, right? So that's how a superhero film generally works, right? There's that external, exterior climax and action um, that is used as a climax of the film. Most short stories that we read are going to have interior climaxes where the, the protagonist has to come to terms with the change in life or come to terms with um, maybe an aspect of their own character that they didn't want to acknowledge or think about or, you know, something like that, right? So anyway, so that's the climax at stage three of, uh, of a narrative. But of course, oh, sorry, <laughs> I forgot uh, I was going to talk about epiphany here. So epiphany is, uh, as I know here, a sudden intuitive perception or insight into the reality or essential meaning of something, usually initiated by some simple, homely, or commonplace occurrence or experience, right? So it's this sudden realization about uh, what's happening in the world and how maybe what your own perceptions of how the world work were incorrect or, or slightly off, right? And suddenly your, your experience of the world changes in some way because you have this insight into how things work. And we've all had epiphanies. It's just a, it's a very fancy sounding word. Um, we've all had epiphanies. It's part of maturing, right? Where you suddenly realize like, oh, you know, uh, my parents don't know everything. Or, oh, um, I have to make my own choices now in the world. Or, you know, something like that, right? Those kind of like realizations about your place in the world. Uh, and this, you know, this is a term and an idea I want you to think about when you're reading. Um, the first story, reading all the stories, but especially the first story because it's built around this epiphany, right? It's a very, it's, it's, you know, I've chosen this first story, the story of an hour, because it is this very tight, compressed narrative with this very traceable kind of structure to it. And it's got this very clear kind of like turn in our character, this epiphany that she has. And it kind of takes us in unexpected ways, but it's definitely a very clear epiphany she's having. Okay, anyway, so that's uh, the epiphany. Generally, part of the climax. It's a very common tool that authors use when they get to the climax. You know, the the, the protagonist comes face to face with the what they thought about the world or what they thought about themselves, and they have this realization that something and something changes for them, right? So here's a maybe a funny way to think about epiphany, right? The Keanu Reeves meme is all about Keanu Reeves having these kind of silly epiphanies, right? Generally, in stories, they're a lot more serious. Well, they're always more serious, right? 
So that takes us to stage four, right? The story, a narrative doesn't end with the climax, right? Uh, the Avenger films don't end with the Avengers beating Thanos or whatever happens. There's something that happens afterwards, right? The, the, there's, there's resolution for all the, the, the things that have happened. You know, the loose, t loose strings are tied up. So this is what we call the falling action, right? So the outcome is resolved, right? We've had that climax, and then we have events occur as a direct result of that climax. Right? Sometimes that's good, sometimes it's bad. Um, as I note here in classic tragedy, this is where the hero reflects on his tragic mistake, his or her tragic mistake, right? So if you've read Macbeth, remember that from high school or whatnot, uh, you'll realize that the climax is, you know, him fighting uh, Macduff, and then he um, is wounded, fatally wounded, but it doesn't end there. He doesn't die, and then, oh, lights out, so, you know, the curtain comes across the stage. Uh, you know, he gets this 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 time to realize, oh man, I've been mistaken this whole time. You know, all this all this time I thought I was the hero and I was I was the one in charge and this whole story was about me and it turns out I'm just a villain, right? And he gets this this time on stage to go through that that process and that out that um, fallout from the, the the climax. And this is what we call catharsis, right? This kind of like emotional relief allowed through that moment with Macbeth because the whole time you know to, 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 to dwell on Macbeth a little bit there's this uh, dramatic irony where we know as an audience we know the whole time that he's being misled he's going down the wrong path and he's misreading things right we know he's making mistakes and he's not living up to his what he should be doing um, and so it's there's this tension caused between the audience and what Macbeth is doing and then when finally Macbeth realizes the same thing then the audience gets this emotional relief, right? So that's what we call catharsis. It doesn't happen in all narratives. It was, um, it's definitely a part of a lot of Shakespeare, right? A lot of, uh, especially drama and theater, use a lot of catharsis in that third act um, falling action moment. But sometimes you get this in, in short stories too, right? This emotional release or relief when, you know, finally things have boiled over to the top and, you know, people can deal with the aftermath. And this takes us to the last part, uh, it's called the denouement, if you want a Frenchy, fa fancy, fancy French word, or just the ending, if you want, you prefer that, the resolution, right? Events are concluded, loose ends are tied up. Um, this is um, a very short part of the, the story, often. Um, uh, you know, in, in older stories, this might have been stretched out, the author might have offered a moral or something, right? Contemporary authors uh, don't necessarily do anything like that. They want to leave things open for you to think about it, right? They leave things ambiguous, right? Many of the many of the stories we read uh, and we we think of as like literary stories don't give us that 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 neatly packaged um, ending, right? The resolution is left open, and we're supposed to interpret and have different ideas about what the story means and what the ending means, right? That's what we call the denouement. So. You know, that's, again, there's Freytag's Pyramid, Exposition, Rising Action, Climax, Falling Action, Denouement. Uh, if we were going to draw this more realistically, right, it would look something like this. And then when we get to this part, this would be very small. This would be a very small downward slope and then a very small plateau up here, right? Because usually the falling action and the denouement are very brief moments of the story. Most of a story is the rising action, right, leading up to that climax. That climax is also a brief moment in the story for the most part and then the the fallout and the wrap-up is also usually very brief so that would be a more realistic model right if you had a very short part up here but this is the model that uh, people use when they're discussing narrative it's very commonly uh, uh, used and talked about right um, this would be like first act down here second act and then third act Climax and falling action denouement, if you want to use the act structure as well. People often use that when they're talking about screenwriting or plays, right? First act, third act, second act. Um, okay, one last thing, some terms to think about. Plot. Plot is the events of the narrative, and theme is the main idea. And these are different things, and we will return to this idea later in the semester, but I want to put that out on the table right away. Okay, thank you for watching. I uh, hope that was useful, and have a good day.